Talking tactics today, uh, this is number two. Number two from Ararat. Number two for the Campbells, actually, because I had uh, John Campbell. Grant Campbell joins me. Grant, um, I've been told by a couple of people they never knew you and me were brothers. That's uh, probably a good thing for you, mate. Yeah, I don't know. They must have been living under a log, have they? I thought everyone knew that. Uh, anyway, I guess they do now. Uh, well, that's that's okay. Talking tactics, mate. I like uh, promoting uh, drives, um, probably seeing things differently that other people don't see sometimes in, in, in races. Major Assassin last night, I, I was incredibly intrigued uh, by the race. It, it just, um, I can't believe you got a 32-2 quarter Going into the race, like he was first up, what was what were your thoughts? Yeah, well, um, to be honest, before the fields were done, uh, I thought, you know, the horse had been working quite well. Um, he's always been a horse that does improve with a little bit of racing. You know, a lot of our horses, we can have them pretty screwed down, ready to race, um, which he clearly was, but they use, he's a horse that has gone better after a couple of starts. So before the field was drawn, I was sort of thinking that, He'll just be going there, um, you know, for a hit out. Hopefully he runs on and, um, you know, we're happy with him. And, and then when the field was drawn and he drew three, um, it sort of changed my thinking just a fraction because um, there didn't look to be a huge amount of pressure in the race. Um, I wasn't 100% sure whether he could lead or not. Um, but from barrier three, you've got no option but to roll off the gate a little bit to at least get yourself into the running line. Um, and by doing that last night, he then found the front uh, you know, uh, did a little bit of work the first couple of hundred metres but um, and then got a very good run after that. And, yeah, we, we managed to sneak a pretty cheap first quarter, which we probably needed first up, um, which was shown by the fact that they were closing on him late, but he still did enough to hang on. But, um, yeah, I was really happy with his run. Um, and, yeah, hopefully there is some improvement out of the run. I've just started the video, just a, um, just a little bit... Uh... Uh, late getting it um, up and going. You've got basically gone around the first turn. I was surprised here, there was just no pressure put on you. Once you crossed to the front, there was no pressure put on you. And one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this drive is, this is an old fashioned drive. This is a Mooney Valley drive. Get to the front, do as little as you can for as long as you can before anyone puts any any style of pressure on you. It doesn't happen these days in the in the races were you surprised that you could get such a soft lead time like your lead time was 45 5 but then a 32 2 quarter with no one like lisa miles was looking for cover but no one wanted to come around yeah look it is a surprise nowadays because you, you very rarely see 32 2 quarters anywhere um there's generally moves made and in, in races as soon as there's a back off um but look, assessing this race beforehand it didn't look like there was a lot of mid-race pressure um aiken thought uh, had been very impressive, but but coming off um, quiet runs, um, so they were going to have to either chance their arm and driving differently, differently to have how they had been, um, or try and get over the top of this late. Um, so apart from him, there was probably no one else really in the race. Um, you know, Mick Stanley's mess sometimes does a little bit of work in racing, but it's usually over the shorter trip. Yep. Um, so you know that it all just played into our hands, and yeah, look. I am a bit old-fashioned, I suppose, sometimes. Um, so, you know, he was a horse first up. He needed a breather. Uh, we managed to get it, and he could still slip home his half in, you know, a bit under 56 seconds, which makes you nearly impossible to catch. But, um, yeah, it was nice. You know, it's not often at all at Melton that you get halfway around the first corner and nobody is coming, and nobody comes for the next 800 metres. You know, it's pretty rare. So. I've stopped the race at the 1,200 metre mark. So basically, you've had a 45-5 and then a 32-2, and you're still not getting any pressure. But then does it go back to the mentality, or oh, they can come from everywhere, because then you really started to step up. And you, you actually start stepping up without even having that look. Um, I know you like looking um, a lot of the time where everyone is, but was it just that how comfortable he was feeling from that point onwards? Yeah, a little bit the horse as well. Um, in the past, he's been uh, a little bit hot-headed, um, and I was a little unsure as to whether he would relax for me. Um, his previous couple of runs before he went for a spell, uh, he was up and about and we sort of were driving him pretty strong in probably slightly weak classes and, and he would get pretty fired up on Karen. And, um, but he was strong enough to keep running and, and, and do a good job and win those two races. Um, 
I didn't believe he could do that this week. Um, you know, if he'd have fired up as soon as I got to the front, he would have been in trouble. It wouldn't have been a 32-2 first quarter and he probably doesn't win the race. Um, but so luckily we did get that chance to back off. He relaxed. Um, it sort of got to the stage or at about the 1200 that the horse outside me just started to creep a little bit closer and the horse on my back was pulling a bit, sort of bumped me a couple of times and I think my horse sort of sensed that and he quickened himself. Um, and I think the wind played a little bit of a factor into it as well. I think part of that first quarter is sort of headwind and then the, the grandstand protects you a little bit from the wind and you sort of get a bit of, you build a little bit of speed. Uh, these horses nowadays, like it really... Karen actually said to me, she said, I didn't think he quickened at all the second quarter. And I said, well, neither did I. And yet there's a 3.5, uh, 2.5 seconds difference in those two quarters. It didn't feel like there was any difference. Um, you know, horses nowadays just run time so easily. And on these tracks, you know, in the nice weather, it was a nice mild night last night. There was a bit of wind, but it was still very mild. Um, so, yeah, and then he started to build. And, and luckily, again, he didn't want to rip and tear down the back too much. We could still just sort of control that quarter. And that left us with a really good kick on the corner. I've got everyone confused because I hit the wrong button for two secs, but we're back to where I wanted to be. We've actually got Josh just pulled out three deep. We're um, just outside the Tab Court Park sign down the back. Well, just past the mile marker, actually, Granny. Like you've gone, gone that full lap. The way people drive now, you get your main danger comes out. This is where you you go for home. And, and then this is... You know, like I said, I, I've watched things probably a little bit differently. This is, to me, a Barry Alford drive, not a Chris Alford drive. Back in the day, you stack them and rack them. Even though Josh came out, he didn't put any pressure on you. So you just say, well, we'll just go whatever speed's comfortable. Yeah, look, I uh, again, it's sort of come back to the fact that uh, he was first up. And I figured if I let him run at the five or 600, we might be in trouble at the two, you know, that 200 or the 100. Um, so just... And he's always had a pretty good turn of speed in him, the horse, and he's sort of always been a pretty strong finisher as well. He doesn't shirk an issue at all. Uh, he was getting tired on the line, but he always fights races out pretty strong no matter how much work he's done. So I just wanted to wait a little bit longer. Um, it may have been a different story if Josh had been able to... Uh, if Josh had let his horse roll, I probably would have rolled a bit earlier. But when he didn't and he was sort of content to be three wide and then when we hit the home turn and he was sort of the first or three wide I figured well let's start rolling now and make him earn it around the corner and see if we can't hold him off and yeah luckily we did um you know yeah I, I probably I like the reference I like I love watching the older guys like Barry Alford and all them when they used to drive and yeah they used to use we, you could probably use the tracks more in those days where you could uh stack them up a little bit on the uh in the straights a bit and then make your corners a little bit quicker and then any horse trying to make any ground just really found it hard. So probably can't do that quite as much on these bigger tracks nowadays, but it is still definitely an advantage to be on the fence. It's quite funny. There was uh, three drivers over your shoulder on the close-up they just had of the uh, footage. Johnny Keldo, Steve Cleave, Daryl Douglas. I'm sure all three of those appreciated it. Probably didn't. They probably all wanted speed on and you to get going a bit quicker in the, in the race. But they would have appreciated, uh, yeah, different times and um, that different style of racing, Grano. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're all probably of a similar era. Maybe probably throwing Johnny a bit of a lifeline there. He's probably a fraction <laughs> older than the rest of us. But, uh, he's older. You know, than, he, he's older than me, so he's well and truly older than <laughs> you guys. Yeah, but you know that was uh, that was your bread and butter back in the day on the little tracks. You'd uh, you'd try and find the front, and then you just had to control the tempo of the race. You know, racing's changing so much. Nowadays, it's getting a lot more, a lot more like the American style. I think we're not there yet. We still look to, most of us still look to probably try and get a cheap quarter. Um, uh, at some stage, you know that doesn't seem to happen in the states that much. Yeah. And, and you watch angle racing; it's a bit the same. They kind of, well, to us, it looks like they're not getting, they're not backing off. I guess some of those twenty-eight quarters on them big tracks, they probably are backing off. But uh, when you when your times are one fifty or better. Um, it doesn't look like they have it all. So, no. uh, yeah, it probably takes some of us older style guys a little bit to uh, get our head around the way some of these young blokes drive nowadays. I've spoken to you recently, and I know you, you've got right into the American race and been able to watch it online. You actually do enjoy the American racing, though, don't you? Like, we're not actually here to bag it out because you actually do enjoy it. Oh, it's great. Watched a couple of races, replays just before when I come inside for lunch, and... Um, 
Uh, yeah, I think Shartin got beaten. And uh, who else did I watch? I think um, I watched an old Australian horse there, Stars Align. He won. He went 148-1, I think. And he uh, he made all the play. He uh, he was running. I think he went 120-something to the quarter, um, which is pretty strong. And, uh, yeah, I enjoy it. You know, Terran sometimes watches it and, and says, what are they doing? Why do they do that? I said, that's, that's the American-style racing. Um, some of their... Uh, some of the you know everyday racing can be a little bit boring, but if you watch their feature races, they definitely uh, they've got a different mindset in the feature races. And uh, yeah, I actually quite enjoy it. There's a lot of tactics that go on too, isn't there? It's it's hidden tactics. You've got to sort of understand what, what they're trying to do, where they posse up, and, and the likes. But there's definitely a lot of tactics involved. Yeah, it's a little bit like um, you know watching the the late great Gavin Lang. Um, you know, people would watch Gavin and think. Why did he let that horse in on the first corner? Um, and then if you watch the race unfold, there is generally a very, very good reason why Gavin did it. He uh, he was better off having that horse out of his way or he knew it was the horse that would cart him into the race later. Um, and, yeah, it was very rarely that Gavin did that, you know, and, and it turned out to be the wrong move. And it seems to be a little bit that way watching the American racing. They, uh, they'll go into the first corner and uh, that's one of the things Karen goes, Crook, why do they just let each other in? And, yeah, I think it's if the horse is an outsider, they they'd rather it be out of their way, um, yeah, or it's a horse that they can possibly follow into the race, and and that's yeah, I think our racing is going that way a little bit. It, it's uh, you see that a bit in Menangle. Some of the Menangle racing is a bit boring, um, but then you know it's 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 a different track completely to anything else we've got here in Victoria, so it's going to be different racing. Absolutely. Andy McCarthy, you talk about the Americans. Andy, Andy McCarthy, and uh, he's driving the Mohawk Millions, did it, and he also done it in the um, the Hamiltonian. Um, he made sure he had the right horse to follow into the race. He got onto its hat. He didn't care about anyone else. He was just looking for one hat to follow, and uh, once he found those hats, he was quite happy just to track them, wait for them to put them into the race. So there, there is a lot to it, and hopefully, I think a lot of people should watch it. I think it's uh, really, really entertaining. Granny, um, I've got a stay and parade on tomorrow uh, live for uh, Northern Rivers Equine from 4 o'clock on my Facebook and YouTube channel. So I want anyone to wants to join in. John Coffey will be available for interaction um, as well. We'll Mark Hughes uh, from Woodlands. And the reason I'm actually saying that too is that I will be there and we'll do a little bit more with um, American Ideal because I know on the crest of a wave, we did a, a story on, a, I think it was last week, um, leaving the stable more than a horse. Um, what Pete, these horses mean to you? And she's she started on that next journey of her career, hasn't she? She has, yeah. She uh, she got picked up yesterday by the transport and uh, has made her way across the Ben Stud. So um, yeah, she's now in the capable hands of um, the Judd family and everyone else over there. Um, they look after her really well, and uh, yeah, it was a little bit sad to see her go. She's been a bit like part of the furniture for quite a while here, and uh, but you know, it's the next step in her life and hopefully um hopefully she's sending back some nice fast uh you know babies in the years to come first one by american ideal let's hope it's uh hopefully it's a superstar but we'll see what happens oh yeah i did a little bit with him the other day american ideal and uh his foals are cool dudes i know why because he's a cool dude he uh he's got he's got a lot of fun about him he's he's, he's a lovely horse he'll be in the stadium parade tomorrow but Again, I'll do a little bit more with Kath McIntosh, so keep watching Campbell's comments to keep up to date. And then I'll be going up to Juddie's, showcase his place, um, which is hard to do. Hopefully, he might take me to New South Wales. If, have you seen you just left me, Granny? Might be back. Not sure what happened then. He's back. Sorry. No, you're right. Uh, his new place, he's got some uh, He's got some five-star uh, establishment uh, set up there in New South Wales, which is really good for, for Craig Judd as well. So we'll be uh, touching base with, with him. Grano, thank you very much. I know you love doing these things um, every time I <laughs> ask you, but I do do appreciate it. And I love the insight, and I think uh, well done to Tom. Greg Bediel, another of the owners that can't get to the trots, loves going to the trots and watching his horses um, all the time. And uh, I'm not sure if Grant's got an audio issue Sorry. or something. It's all, all good. Uh, so he's another one. Uh, John Hawke, we are talking about. John Campbell, we were talking about. It's, it's, it's trying times, but hopefully... Trying to bring uh, a little bit of colour anyway uh, for the owners and the likes. I'm sure Greg was over the moon, Granny. Yeah, very happy. It's very nice to get a winner for him too. He's been a very loyal supporter of ours and mine for quite a long time and he's been a breeder for a long time and they're the sort of people that we need to uh, 
to encourage to breed more. He's, he's backed off his breeding quite a bit um, over the last few years, and it'd be really nice if we can turn things around and get those blokes to breed again and, and more people to join in. So, yeah, let's fingers crossed that you know, um, all this interaction and these bonuses and things are going to make that happen. Absolutely. He bred, he bred a lot of horses. Campbell's comments, talking tactics. Thanks very much, Grant Campbell. Thanks, Polly.